In all our explorations, discovery has been fueled by technological advancement. And technological advancement is fueled by discovery. There is a symbiotic relationship between our understanding of the universe and our primal desire to seek the unseen. These principles have guided exploration and discovery for millions of years, from the discovery of fire to the invention of FTL travel. There are times, however, when our pioneering spirit outpaces our scientific understanding, and we cannot accurately discern or describe what our eyes perceive. Such was the voyage of the crew of the Rowanus, and the fabled discovery of the planet Odori. On 182-624 PA, Aleodeli's statesman Tauros Vinali launched a campaign of conquest that would go on to envelop the entirety of the galaxy for the next 12 years. These series of major conflicts are categorized into the first, second, third, and fourth Vinalian Wars. And while the third Vinalian War was the longest, largest, and most devastating of these conflicts, it might just be the second Vinalian War that proved the most fateful. In 624, the states of Aleodel and Syndicate Space came to blows during the Battle of the Galarian Front. Tauros Vinali, leading the Aleodeli, launched a surprise attack on Syndicate forces, taking them on three sides. The ships fled the battle, but in doing so, they crossed the Zulara Vale. Immediately, all contact with the ships was lost. This incident led to the discovery of Wim Space. The governing body of Syndicate Space, the Alliance, attempted a rescue mission, but this too ended in tragedy as those forces were lost. Facing a growing threat from the Aleodeli Empire, the Alliance officially declared the ships and all their crew missing in action. In the years and decades that followed, many would venture into the uncharted sector, routinely ending in disaster. Eventually, in 683, the chief authority within the Alliance, the Supreme High Council, made all travel to Wimspace illegal. Aleodel, being the only other nation bordering on Wimspace, did not expressly forbid travel to the sector, but heavily discouraged it. Over the years, many people fancied themselves the next great frontiersmen. They'd gather together a ragtag collection of poor souls and venture off to meet a fate that we can only speculate on. The Rowanus was different though. This wasn't just some hobbled together crew. This was a legitimate operation, founded and funded by one of the wealthiest and most influential figures of the time. Alor Vakari was a prominent Aleodeli mogul who had pledged to map Wim's space. Using her considerable resources, she commissioned a ship to be built and staffed by experienced ex-naval pilots, soldiers, and scientists. On 106-833 PA, the Rowanists departed Mullenlin to much fanfare and applause. Three years later, the ship came limping back into Syndicate space with only one passenger on board. Shazav Tratis II was an engineer aboard the Rowanus. Upon her return, she was hurried away to hiding. The Aleodeli government demanded Tratis be returned to her home, but the Alliance was not so quick to release her. The Supreme High Council worked hard to keep her a secret, but eventually her journeys leaked to the public. What follows is a transcript of a testimony given by Shazov Tratis II to the Supreme High Council on 16-836 PA. As we entered Wim space, a palpable sense of fear washed over the crew. The excitement we were met with upon our departure from Molenlin was but a distant memory now. In place of eagerness and desire for glory, I saw terror and uncertainty in all but the captain. Alor Vakari took command of the ship herself. For someone whose name was made in real estate, she commanded a ship as well as any captain I had served under. 
She was unrelenting, unflinching. As we crossed the veil, she spat. The space outside was quiet, even as far as space is concerned. We sat motionless for what felt like hours as we careened deeper into the unknown territory. The whole thing was rather uneventful. But just before it could be declared a disappointment, the space began to come alive. Flakes of dust littered the outside space. At first, no larger than what you'd find on a windowsill. But the dust grew until the flakes were the size of rocks. Strange, small creatures lived in that vacuum. Tiny, space-faring insects that glowed a blinding white. You've never seen such a light. It didn't just shine, it danced. It warped around the ship, taking us from all angles, a million little cannons blinding us where we sat. You'd close your eyes, but it'd do nothing. The light shined right through you. I remember looking down at my hands and seeing my bones, my veins, my blood. We turned off our engines, which caused the light to dim until once again we were wrapped in darkness. From here, without the hum of the ship, we were subject to the sounds of space, which normally meant nothing. But whim space is different. Whim space is alive. The darkness outside purred and moaned. It, it cried and laughed. It climbed aboard our ship. The captain pressed her face against the glass, tears rolling down her cheeks. She yelled out words, but they weren't meant for us. She spoke a language my translator couldn't process, and she paid our calls no mind. I remember the first time I met someone of a different species. I was still in my youth, and I remember being so curious about them. It stirred in me something insatiable, a curiosity that would drive me throughout my life to study the phenomenons which I didn't understand. I've spent a lifetime traveling the cosmos, poring over ancient texts and studying abandoned ruins. And when I tell you that the truly alien lives beyond the Zulara Vale, I mean it. I saw it. I saw vacuum-breathing leviathans that could swim through space, large enough to swallow moons. I saw stars twisted and warped into odd shapes, light bending in impossible directions. I saw exploded moons and dead planets, like some terrible war ravaged all the lands. The captain decided she had seen enough. We had to find ground. We had spent days floating aimlessly through the void. As if delivered by the gods, we found it. The first planet in Wim space. A lush, green planet thick with vegetation. The joy in the captain's eyes was something I hadn't seen in my life. We touched down, the tension was ripe. We scanned the surface, taking samples and collecting data. We established camp, being sure to take all the necessary precautions. There was no sign of intelligent life on the planet, but there was remnants. We found a cliffside made of pure limestone, decorated in glyphs all along its facade. Some carved into the stone, some painted with thick red soil, some burned. They didn't appear to have any consistent patterns or motifs. Captain Vakri named the planet Odori, though 
she never told us what it meant. The planet, though, was most strange. Walk for an hour in any direction and you'd cross desert sands, jungle thickness, open plains, and packed snow. Biomes changed frequently and without care, emerging where they had no right to. We dared not venture far from the Rowanus. We used the ship as a base of operations, living out of it for the better part of a year. That was the most exciting time of my life. All my research and notes proved useless here. The scientific method failed us. Every day, new samples challenged our notions of the universe around us. We would spend our days exploring, studying, and researching, and spend our nights drinking, dancing, and laughing. That planet was alive. Not in the sense that all planets are. Odory was living. There was an energy about this planet. The air was heavy and the wind whispered as it whipped. Sometimes it'd shush us and we'd sit in silence for hours. Other times, it encouraged our exploration. Mainly though, it talked to us in our sleep. Dreaming on Odory was unlike dreaming as you know it. Here, you dreamed as one, freely interacting with others as you move through a shared space. There, in the dream, you were not bound by the rules that govern the planet. You could fly, you could breathe underwater, you could change forms. Once, I dreamt I was a winged beast whose shadow blanketed mountains. I could feel the wind sweep over my skin. I could taste the thick, humid air. I could see for miles. And as the wind swept over me, it whispered, up, faster, down, now. That's when I saw it, tucked deep in the jungles, reclaimed by nature, so hidden I almost missed it, but I didn't. I saw that structure and I knew it was real. I knew we had to go there. And at once, I knew all this happiness would vanish. We set out the next day, carrying all our essential cargo on our backs. We didn't have a map, but more of a feeling. Odory guided us through its labyrinth of a surface. We followed the wind, the curvature of the hills, the rustling of the leaves. At night, the stars seemed to align, pointing us in a direction. For three days, we marched long, grueling distances. The captain paced the line checking on every member, keeping them hydrated and nourished and inspired. Through distant marches across unforgiving terrain, Captain Vackery managed to always keep spirits high. And finally, we found it. A temple, older than time and larger than space. Built mostly underground, but it wasn't a cave. It was a world beneath the surface. Under the crust of Odory, valleys of grass ran. Streams, rivers, lakes, waterfalls raged. Smaller temples could be found deep in this hidden realm. High on the ceiling, glyphs shined like stars. This underground world proved unsettling. We sat up a base of operations in the valleys next to a small temple, but the cavernous ceilings made it dark and cold. Water would drip down on us from the ceiling above. The wind couldn't reach us in this place. Instead, we had the long, tormented howls of the caves. Still, morale was high. We had discovered what we believed the most ancient structure in the galaxy. 
I have been to the Wim Ruins. I had seen and studied at Ayanora and Sharirzin and Anrinurin. This, this was different. This was a realm beyond our understanding of the word. Untouched by the march of evolution and unfaltering in its endurance, it was a cliff of antiquity standing against the waves of time. With each passing day, we made our way deeper into that labyrinth. Inching further, we made calculated expeditions, taking every precaution to ensure our safety. And the further we went, the stranger it got. Recognizable features like temples and doorways vanished. In their stead were massive, cavernous rooms that stretched for miles. Tunnels bore through the rock in queer shapes. As we progressed, the feeling of fatigue and unease started to set in. But Captain Vaccary's resolve never faltered. Each night we made camp, the captain would regale us with heroic tales of heroes long past. She spoke of the mighty Tamarisk and his vengeance against the god. She spoke of ancient Volsaian heroes and their triumphs. After a time, she began to speak of a people no one knew. They had strange names like Zuval Zalzix and Krinox Ufers. These stories enraptured us and inspired us to press on. As we ventured forth, the glyphs that once lit our paths began to fade and our instruments failed us. We tethered ourselves together to make our way through the pitch black of Odori's underbelly, trusting in our captain to see us through. And that she did. After living in the dark for what felt like an eternity, we found the light. Deep beneath the surface of this place, we found what could only be described as the most confounding discovery in the history of scientific endeavor. An ocean, underground, with water that was every color of the rainbow. The tides of the water slashed in every direction. Waterfalls fed the reservoir, falling from high on the ceiling. The most peculiar was the gravity. There didn't appear to be any. Massive pillars of water rose from the ocean, spiraling and fading into mist. Waves rose, crested, and exploded as they crashed into each other in a violent dance. The water pulsated and changed colors as it flowed. Small streams spilled out in every direction, some flowing straight up. These veined across what we assumed was the entirety of the planet feeding its soil and nurturing its life. This has to be it, the captain said. We cheered and reveled in our discovery, hugging each other and shouting to the heavens. The captain, however, did not seem to share in our delight. She was visibly angry, and when pressed, she screamed at our lieutenant. What she was looking for, none of us could say. But this moment marked a notable shift in Captain Vaccary. She no longer told stories or made efforts to guide our research. Each morning she would strike off on her own, exploring nearby tunnels, not returning for hours on end. She ate only once every few days. She made no attempt to maintain her hygiene. Her hair had grown matted and clumped, her teeth yellowed and her stench reeked concerns were not kept hidden. As the captain was away, several members of our expedition voiced frustrations with Captain Vaccary. Some even suggested we turn back. But how could we? Without her, we had no way of navigating the darkness. Without her, we would not have found this divine place. The captain had her own reasons for this journey we knew, but regardless of her agenda, she led us here. It was not for us to abandon her now. Tensions were growing in the camp, but just before they could boil over, there she was, striding from those tunnels as beautiful as anyone had seen her, smiling 
ear to ear, she had an energy about her not seen since we first touched down on Odery. I found it! She exclaimed. Her excitement was palpable. She hugged several members around her with tears in her eyes. She dropped to her knees and screamed to whatever gods watched down on us. Lieutenant Cal Cook asked her what she had found and she looked at him with a smile on her face and said, let me show you. The next day, we followed the captain into one of her tunnels. Leaving all gear behind, we marched for hours as she rambled on about the whim. She told us of her visits to each whim site, her lifelong studies of the people. She spoke to us of all her theories and ideas regarding their disappearance. We came on a massive hole in the ground. The captain had already prepared a repelling cable. And one by one, we lowered ourselves into the mouth. The bottom was hot. So hot that we stripped off most of our clothes. There was a single tunnel at the bottom of that hole with a light burning so bright we had to shield our eyes. She commanded us to follow. And we did. We followed her through that tunnel towards the light. And once through the tunnel, we saw it. A colossal trench split the earth. It stretched endlessly in either direction, so wide we couldn't see the other side. Down in that abyss, fire and brimstone lived. Explosions rocked the ground beneath us. Fire licked our flesh and seared our skin. So hot was the air, we strained to keep our eyes open. The captain pointed down into the flames, but no one dared look. The fire was too hot to stare into. Captain Vackery turned to us, with tears streaming down her face. Beastler, Thestiers, all Vinars she said in a low tone. Whatever traumas you have endured in life, I promise you do not know fear. You cannot. You have not stood at the end of the world and stared into hell itself. Odori was alive. This was a reality we had came to accept early on. But if the ocean under its surface was the planet's joy, then this was its rage. This was every morsel of anger and violence buried deep where no one could find it and it was trying to escape. Immediately we were scared. Some cried, some fell to their knees, some looked around in panic. Lieutenant Cal Cook approached Captain Vackery as she stood on the edge of the abyss. The two spoke calmly for some time. Captain Vackery put an arm around Cal Cook's shoulder and she pushed him into the flames. The captain turned to us with rage in her eyes. Beastler, feasters, Walfenars. She repeated as she approached us. She grabbed the nearest person and threw them over the edge. We scrambled, running towards the rope we used to descend. People stumbled and tripped over each other. They shoved each other to the ground. Captain Vackery followed the crowd with an easy walk. She stomped on legs, breaking them. She was no longer the bold and daring figure who inspired us on this voyage. She was a demonic force, possessed of rage, here to bring about our destruction. We climbed over each other, trying to grab the rope. Every time someone grabbed hold, another would rip them away and claim it for themselves. Some climbed the facade, but without proper gear, their hold gave way, and they fell back to the bottom, bones cracking and splitting as they hit the ground. Once escape was no longer an option, we tried to survive. 
we charged the captain. There were dozens of us, yet she tore through us with ease, possessed of strength and speed you can't possibly understand. We stood no chance. I watched the captain cave a man's skull in with her fist. I watched her tear a person's arm out of their socket. I watched her break necks the way one might loosen a jar. In between her guttural screams, she would chant those same horrible words. Beastler, beasters, we're all finars. In all the chaos, I saw my opportunity while my friends and colleagues were being slaughtered by the vanguard of our journey, I turned my back and ran. Their screams echoed off the walls and rocked my very soul. Whether or not I'll ever be able to forgive myself for this act of cowardice, I can't say. But in that moment, I saw an opportunity for escape and I took it. I ran as fast as I could back to the rope and hurriedly slipped into the harness. I climbed back up the hole as quickly as I could, forgetting everything I knew about form and technique. My palms blistered and bled, my legs ached and my stomach cramped. By the time I was halfway up, the screams had stopped. With tears in my eyes and dread in my heart, I turned and looked down below. I saw Captain Vackery standing vigil, still as a statue, peering up at me with burning cinders for eyes. I screamed at her, an incoherent blast of rage, and resumed my climb. Once atop, I took off running, out of the tunnels, past the glowing ocean that signaled the end of all good things, I ran into the darkness and I kept running until my body failed me for days. I wandered around the pitch black with no clue where I was going. I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was scared. I didn't know if the captain had climbed out of that hole with her bare hands intent to finish the job. I followed nothing but my instincts. And before death called, I could see the light. Be it by chance, divine intervention, or just dumb luck, I managed my way back to our original base camp. From there, I climbed out of the underground hellscape and breathed fresh surface air. Pray that you never need to know relief like I felt. From that moment, I knew I would be safe. Odori would watch over me as she always had. I followed the wind for days. It led me past wooden gargoyles carved into trees, past long abandoned homesteads and ancient vaults. I crossed a charred field where I imagined some great battle once took place, through swamps and bogs, rivers and lakes, across snow-capped mountains and fields of glowing grain. Odori led me home to the Rowanes. From there, I flew off. I flew aimlessly, sleeping for most of the journey. My lips chapped, my will exhausted. I ended up here. How? I don't know. I just followed the music back to the civilization I once knew, but it's not home. This place I was born is no longer of any worth to me. The people who call themselves my parents are but a conduit for my existence. My true home, my true nature, my very essence, is odory. It stands unrivaled in scale and splendor. It possesses a wealth beyond ducats. It's rich in heritage and culture. It is possessed of purpose and vision. Odory is all we can hope to be. Buried beneath its surface is a rage you cannot understand. But does that detract from the beauty it brings? Is that not unlike us all? Simmering in our hearts is a rage and ability to unleash chaos. But that's not who we are. On our surface, we bring joy and wonder to the world around us, infecting it with our will and spirit. 
Odori is you. Odori is me. Odori is the only truth this galaxy has to offer, and I pray to whatever divinities watch over us that I will die beneath its sun. Now, oh, come on. That's just quality storytelling. It's a story that I struggle to believe. Maybe I don't want to. Immediately after the testimony broke, support for engineer Trotus II exploded across the galaxy. Calls for return to Odori rang from Eliodel to Zaiti. Cynic's conspiracy theorist began to break down the alleged discoveries to understand our precursors. But no substantial progress was ever made. For a moment, Shazav Trotus II was the hottest ticket around. She made the rounds across the galaxy. Every media outlet from every network was fighting for her interview. The Alliance attempted to keep her close, but Eliodel demanded she return home. Trotus II responded by saying she had every intention of returning to the only place she hoped to call home, Odori. The words Beesler Theisters Walfinars immediately fell into vogue after the testimony went viral. Their meaning can never truly be known. If they are from any language at all, it is not one any person in our galaxy knows. Colloquially, people have come to define the phrase as, Now I bring unto you my swift and deadly vengeance. The phrase quickly became a pseudo swear word used to insult and intimidate others. More recently, it has been turned into a sort of rallying cry, particularly used by sports teams and military combatants. Look, whether or not Shazav was off a nut or telling the God's honest truth, I, just, I don't really think it matters. You know? The story exists. It's been canonized in our history. You know, people... Like the like all the, the the scientists and the historians, they're obsessed with this idea of what's true. They don't know what the truth is. Now, the truth is that the truth don't matter. It's how we react. The real truth that matters is what happened to that poor girl. When she got back from that journey, the media picked her apart. Passing her around from one agency to the next, while all these governments fighting after her, the media flocking to her. She never stood a chance when she got back. She suffered a mental breakdown, was institutionalized. A year later, she was dead. You think her or her family gave a shit about whether or not you believe her story? The only truth in this world that matters is that human and non eel hook, astral, alien, don't matter. We're all just people trying to do our best. And life sucks. And it's hard. And we all have to cope with it in the ways that we know how. A little bit of empathy never killed anybody. But lack of it sure did. Between the trauma endured on her voyage and the sudden onset of intergalactic fame, Shazab Trotus II suffered a mental breakdown on 318-837 PA. She was committed and received treatment, but ultimately died when she was given the wrong medication. Of course rumors spread of her murder at the hands of the government, but no evidence has ever arisen to support such a claim. It is the conceit of all scientists that there are phenomena in our galaxy we do not understand. And recognizing that you do not know what you do not know is the basis for all discovery. In most avenues of life, the truth is subjective. The reality we occupy is definite. The same laws of our universe hold true from end to end. How we experience them, however, is open for interpretation our perception of the world is shaped by our own past experiences and how we project them onto our current ones. 
Perhaps this is a coping mechanism, a way for our brains to easily interpret and decipher what we experience in a way that makes sense to us. Regardless, reality is not as objective as one might assume. It is possible every word of Shazav Tratus II's testimony is true, and beyond the Zulara Veil rests a planet rife with arcane knowledge. It is equally likely, though, that her story was a fabrication, meant to hide some truth she did not wish to get out. The reality is that we'll never know. 1500 years ago, two species came together to form the basis for an interstellar civilization. In that time, we have made breakthroughs, suffered losses, achieved victories and uncovered mysteries. Yet the whim remain a constant, an enigmatic holdover from an epoch long past. Their ruins tell a story of divine reverence and scientific pursuit. They speak to the mystic nature of the whim, proving a cipher impossible to crack, even after all this time. In the Terran 20th century, novelist Vladimir Nabokov said, Existence is a series of footnotes to a vast, obscure, unfinished masterpiece. While it is easy to view the whim as a footnote, a failed empire whose existence has been reduced to a series of ruins and ghost stories, it is equally valid to view them as a testament to the indomitable nature of existence. Before all the mystery and piety, the whim were a people, resplendent with a culture all their own. They laughed, cried, fought, and loved, just as we all do. If such a force can be reduced to a memory, a drop of water in an ocean, then what are we? And perhaps more exciting, what else is waiting in those waters? <laughs>